Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we would like to begin. I'd like to welcome you back from a short break in the cause of trying to remain on schedule as much as we can on this very long day. We'll begin, though I'm sure people will continue to come in. My first request is for those of us, uh, and most of us Israelis have them, uh, to turn off your cell phones, and uh, for those of us who have forgotten to do so, uh, so that we can have uh, smooth proceedings. Uh, for those of you who know him, uh, you realize that uh, I am not Jonathan Franco. He apologizes for not being able to be with us today. He is at home with a high fever, and we will hope that uh, he'll be able to return and be with us again at our future events. It is an honor, however, to be able... My name. <laughs> oh, yeah, just for the protocol. Yeah, I understand. I understand. Uh, yes, Mr. Coordinator. No, my name is uh, Dr. Jonathan Dekelchen. I'm also I'm part of the Sassoon Center and part of the Hebrew University community. You're welcome. Thank you for reminding me, actually. It's actually quite an honor to be able to replace Jonathan Frankel because he is, in fact, a, one of my scholarly mentors. And so it is truly a unique privilege to be here. Uh, this session is old and new anti-Jewish stereotypes in Eastern Europe. And it's also an honor to be able to introduce uh, the first of our panelists, uh, Leon Volovich, who is such an indispensable part of the Sassoon Center and is truly the moving force behind our research and publications uh, for, for many years. Um, Leon will be speaking about uh, prejudice and anti-Semitism in the Romanian press, and he will also have a few remarks uh, about the situation in Eastern Europe. Please, Leon. Thank you. <clears throat> I think it works. Yes. Twelve years ago, a few months after the fall of the communist regimes in Eastern Europe and Central Europe, I was in a similar situation as today, sitting next to Konstanty Gebert in the first conference organized by an American university on the same topic, trying to explain the significance of the first wave of antisemitism in the post-communist press. Next to us, if you remember, was the well-known dissident writer Andrei Sinevsky as a keynote speaker. Sinevsky didn't refer to the violent forms of antisemitism in Russia, despite the fact that at that time the Israeli and the Western press were suggesting that pogroms in the main Russian towns were imminent. He was right because, because neither then nor in the following years were the main expression of antisemitism in Eastern Europe violent incidents against the Jews, but rather the verbal forms of aggression. The rich and varied antisemitic rhetoric in the press became the barometer not of the relations between the Jewish community and the majority populations as it was before the Holocaust, but an indicator of the evolution of the collective imagery of the Jew. It is the sensitive point where antisemitism is intersecting with the phobias and obsessions of the post-communist social and economic changes the process of redefining national identity, the examination of the recent past, the national myth, with the traumas and moral responsibility connected with the Holocaust period. Concerning the Romanian press, I think that we can approach the antisemitic discourse by taking as a starting point a number of keywords. Some of them are apparently not connected with antisemitism, like political correctness, NATO, globalization. Other keywords concern only the Jews, communism as a Jewish product, the Holocaust, the culpabilization of the Romanian people, a very frequent expression used in rejecting any idea of moral responsibility for the past, and of course, 
world conspiracy and the Jewish lobby. With some specific differences, these keywords are relevant also in other Central and East European countries. In Romania, the political correctness is a real love-hate affair, and the term is used in the most unexpected contexts. I must say from the beginning that I dislike the term, as do many others. I think that it's a very inappropriate way to name a mainly positive social and intellectual tendency. It immediately awakens up in the traumatized memory of people from the former communist countries the idea of political conformism associated with coercion and duplicity, with the obligation to think one thing and to say something else, imposed by an authority identified previously with the communist regime and identified now with pressure from abroad, the West, United States, European community, the Jewish lobby. So, in Romania, in Romania too, it's not politically correct to be anti-Semite. If you are monitoring anti-Semitism or you are only a masochist Jew, you can collect huge quantities of virulent anti-Semitic articles, but nobody will accept being labeled as an anti-Semite. We must take notice that this important change in mentality and public behavior in interwar Romania, especially during the late 30s, as in nearly, nearly all Eastern uh, Central European countries to openly claim to be an anti-Semite or even to programmatically praise anti-Semitism was not at all shameful or compromising. Offensive or hostile remarks aimed at the Jews could be made in every ambience, including the establishment. One of the leaders and the ideologist of Romanian nationalists, Nikifor Krajnik, did not hesitate to use as his slogan, I quote, our spirit is healthy because it is anti-Semitic, anti-Semitic in theory and anti-Semitic in practice. After the communist period with the official ban of anti-Semitism, but insidious use on their hidden and coded forms, anti-Semitic rhetoric regained it's lost terrain. However, the farmer tolerance or general acceptance of open antisemitism no longer exists. Even the most vociferous users of the antisemitic rhetoric are not interested in being considered antisemites. The situation is completely different when dealing with the gypsies. As with the Jews during the 30s or during the war, one can say or write anything about the gypsies without fearing criticism. The press and the TV daily feed the general hostility to our gypsies and legitimize the popular rhetoric of the increasing gypsy danger. As for anti-Semitic rhetoric, this type of rudimentary racist language can be found frequently only in the extremist press issued and written by publishers formerly linked to Ceausescu's regime, who have continued to develop a harsh ultranationalism, which is violently anti-Hungarian and promotes, especially in the framework of the Great Romania Party and in the newspaper with the same name, an anti-European and anti-American xenophobia. We deal as a different intellectual landscape if we cross to the other source of anti-Semitic rhetoric the new Christian Orthodox right of an open or veiled pro-Iron Guard orientation. The most prominent are some young intellectuals with good Western cult cultural training, sharing a kind of Christian Orthodox fundamentalism and managing, managing a sophisticated style, emphatically theological, far from the rude aggressiveness of the ultranationalist of the former Ceausescu supporters. The refined ambiguity of their intellectual discourse allows their acceptance in the mainstream democratic intellectual circles and in prestigious literary and cultural journals, besides the still marginal neo-pro-Iron Guard publications. 
the new ideology appeals for a new, I quote, moral and spiritual, and spiritual crusade because Christianity must reconquer the world. Among the, crusades, among the crusades' main enemies are, of course, I quote again, the Masonic type ideologies and the prophets of the dissolute liberties. Despite the, un, un, the distance and contempt for the other extreme nationalist direction, considered pseudo nationalistic and populist, of Vadim Tudor and his followers, the anti Jewish themes are similar with the same denial that one is an anti-Semite. It is only a normal, legitimate reaction of self-defense. The word anti-Semite is still associated with Nazi propaganda. It is thus necessary to use a coded language so that one can disclaim the anti-Semitic nature of statements or assertions. In Sinevsky's speech that I mentioned at the beginning, made before an American audience and prepared then for what he would say. He addressed the responsibility of Solzhenitsyn for the coded anti-Semitic language used by Russian intellectuals found in respectable journals. Writers in such journals found an indirect, unintentional support in Solzhenitsyn's essays on the Russian spirit and the role of the Jews in modern Russia. This, I think, also one of the main characteristics of the new Romanian right, the insistent pretension of not being anti-Semitic, even to exonerate their forerunners of this charge as well, and at the same time to articulate a new right doctrine without falling open the original sin of anti-Semitism, and to use tireless anti-Semitic motives, old and new. Moreover, there is a constant effort by all the new bearers of nationalist doctrines to exculpate, to clean the record of the interwar fascist legionary movement of any trace of anti-Semitism. There is in Romania a real effort to build democratic institutions. At the same time, there is an obvious practice, especially on the level of the representative of the power, to simulate democratic thinking in order to appear as a honorable partner among the NATO members at, or at the European community. There is thus a widespread belief that the key to the entry of the NATO or European castle is in Jewish hands. The official Romania is taking its hopes on the American card. American in official Romanian milieu means also Jewish. The visible consequences are obviously positive, even when they do not express the real feelings and beliefs. For example, following the many expressions in the mass media of support for the cult of Marshal Antonescu, the present leaders of Romania have, not, have now issued a decree banning monuments for the former dictator. Several months ago, a virulent anti-Semitic TV station was closed despite protest in the name of the right to free speech. In this context, the representatives of power are playing, sometimes sincerely, sometimes less so, the role of the good guys, leaving the anti-Semitic rhetoric exclusively for the bad guys, the nationalistic parties and newspapers, and the supporters of the new right. Recent pro-Nazi and anti-Semitic graffiti on the walls of the Jewish State Theater in Bucharest were strongly condemned in press declarations as a, a, quote, a quote, an attempt to hurt state, state security on the eve of the Prague summit. It was at Prague when Ro Romania's formal acceptance as a member of NATO was to be decided, and it was decided positively. A theme which usually provokes the return to anti-Semitic stereotypes is the Holocaust. Alongside the known denial and distortions, the use of the term Holocaust is obsessive, as well as the need to minimize or to use it against the Jews as the real instigator of, I quote, 
a holocaust against the Romanian people. In the language of anti-Semitic propaganda, as well in the respectable neutral discourse, the words holocaust and genocide are used in the concrete sense, meaning genocide, and the figurative sense for events, real or imagined, in which the Jews are not implied or in which they are presented as allegedly guilty. Most frequently, anti-Semitic manifestations have resulted from the process of re-evaluating the policies and behavior of national leaders of the recent past. The myths which are spun around these persons and the aura of martyrdom or victimization which are derived from the debate over the responsibility of these leaders for what happened to the Jewish communities under their authority. Official statements and decisions oscillate between a concern to satisfy the Western partners and concessions made to nationalistic groups who reject any critical evaluation of the past. The result was, in the past few years, an original mixture of declarations and even decisions to ban the Antonescu martyrology, along with retracing these positive steps in order not to lo lose popularity and electoral support. In the Romanian extremist press, too, Israel, Israel is a key element of the present anti-Semitic mythology, especially as a superpower dominating world policy. The leader of the great Romanian party, Vadim Tudor, writes in his, new, in his new newspaper, I quote, America doesn't accept any initiative without her consent. It doesn't matter whether one country or another can be attacked and destroyed, Iraq or Yugoslavia. What is important is that the world must fear America, and America fears Israel. This is beyond any doubt. An author of a violent anti-Semitic article at the same newspaper explains why he prefers not to sign with his real name. I quote, the Mossad's antenna are too long, and I do not want to be put on their files. I would like to add some general remarks concerning not only Romania, but the present trends in anti-Semitic discourse in Eastern Europe. There is enough evidence to see that in present circumstances, with limited or very small Jewish communities, anti-Semitic discourse tends to leave aside rational, economic, and social arguments in favor or of irrational stereotypes of a very abstract and imaginary Jew. It stands to reason that dealing with the post-communist countries, we have in mind not only the dis distinct history and political culture of each country, but also the present political realities and different stages of building democratic structures. A far-right radicalism is making room at the margin of the political spectrum and touched also the mainstream. The most significant aspect of this phenomenon remains the proliferation of the anti-Semitic press and political declarations of an anti-Semitic character, used especially during political crisis or election campaigns. The extremist political discourse is responsible for the reproduction and spread of anti-Semitic motives and slogans. The propagandistic or rhetorical dimension seems to be essential for a current stage of East European antisemitism. A glance at the enormous number of texts and of anti-Semitic characters in the press shows the variety of contexts in which anti-Jewish remarks appear. Our conference is mainly about words, words composing sentences and stereotypes, about the power of the words to create and express prejudices, stereotypes, stigma, demonization, to mystify past events or to cover present realities. The transition period and the difficult road to democracy and civil society have produced an atomization of the public discourse, which become also a propitious ground for the proliferation of various anti-Semitic discourses, the instrumental anti-Semitism of politicians, the mass media, 
a rich propagandistic production exposed in every corner and kiosks. Václav Havel called this state of mind that engenders the feeling that everything is permitted and lack of responsibility, this terrible post-communist syndrome. I would say to this post-communist syndrome belongs also an aspect that concerns also the anti-Semitic discourse, a, super, a superficial apparent assumption and use of a democratic language and behavior that is a mimesis of democracy and the adoption of the language of democracy only for export, because it's now normative, more or less, in Western societies, and provides a ticket to enter into European communities. To this ambiguous acceptance of democracy belongs another phenomenon significant for the public, especially political life in post-communist countries the lack of clear distinction and borders between democratic groups and extremist one. Extremist politicians and public publishers can be seen as honorable presence in the democratic press. Respectable politicians accept interviews and collaboration in extremist journals. It's a fluidity, a lack of borders, which facilitate the legitimizing of French politicians and authors, producing a misleading impression that all of them, extremists and Democrats, are legitimate participants in the democratic and, of course, pluralistic public life. In the mainstream press, the extremists do not appear with clear-cut anti-Semitic articles, but this ambiguous mixture offers them a desired respectability. There is also sometimes a mainstream respectable anti-Semitism, discreet, private, coded, elusive, hinting to the extremist, but condemning their noisy and vulgar anti-Semitism. A Romanian analyst is attributing to this mainstream ambiguity an implicit ideology of honorable people. The, the tacit gentleman agreement is broken when a heated polemic breaks out, then suddenly Unexpected anti-Semitic utterances emerge, blaming those who carry out a critical approach of their attitude in Jewish topics or to any topic connected to Jews. The bearer of a critical attitude are, of course, Jews or crypto-Jews or a Western monetizer, an anti-Pole or Russophobe, anti-Romanian, an agent of Moscow, an adept of anti-national American type multicultural society, a self-hatred Pole or Romanian, etc., a communist, a supporter of intellectual terrorists. They have in common a conspiratory vision of all the events, usually based on the idea of the Jewish plot to conquer the world. Under this apocalyptic umbrella were placed also other means to demonize the Jews, to present the Holocaust as a Jewish invention, aiming their dominating goals and to legitimize the establishment of the State of Israel. The success or the failure of contemporary ideologies, such as communism, but also its collapse, globalism and multiculturalism, even the Vatican steps for reconciliation with Judaism, all are symptoms of the invisible hand of the great Jewish manipulator in conformity with the protocols of the elders of Zion. It is not diffi difficult to notice in all the post-communist countries a very paradoxical contrast between the intensity and frequency of anti-Semitic attacks in the extremist press or even anti-Jewish incidents and, by contrast, the genuinely good situation of the remaining Jewish communities, greater or smaller, as well as the friendly atmosphere surrounding the ambassadors of or any Israeli official representative. In the East European countries, we find free Jewish community life with a growing interest in Jewish culture, along with the creation of Jewish cultural and academic institutions and an improving dialogue with the church. And in the past years, we found a most visible reaction in public opinion against antisemitism. Many public debates 
in the mass media on sensitive topics connected with the Holocaust, racism, and anti-Semitic prejudices. Maybe it's too early to provide a comparative evaluation of the recent manifestations of anti-Semitism in Europe. However, there is a striking and unexpected new situation. The latest wave of anti-Semitism, including violent incidents and press campaigns, is affect affecting Western rather than Eastern European countries. There are, of course, political explanations, but it's clear that for the Eastern countries, recently freed from communism, anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism are not on the agenda of the mainstream. And at least in this regard, the West is not a model to follow. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Volovich, uh, for this fascinating exploration of, uh, the, of uh, anti-Semitic images in a time of transition in post-communist uh, Eastern Europe. I can tell you that I, for one, am glad uh, that Dr. Volovich, who made Aliyah in 1984, is making these observations from the safety of the Sassoon Center and not from Bucharest. So, thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Our next speaker, uh, Konstantin Gebert, uh, is both a witness and an active part of the post-communist rebirth of the Jewish community in Poland. His travels in Eastern Europe and his work as a correspondent uh, covering momentous changes in Eastern Europe, as well as the devastation of war in the Balkans, give him a unique perspective on the interaction of people and the role of prejudice. So Konstantin Gebert will address Roma and Jews in the Polish press, selective stereotypes, please. <clears throat> Thank you, Jonathan. Um, just want to follow up on something that, that Leon had said in his presentation about how anti-Semites deny being anti-Semitic and actually are quite offended if, if you call them that. Um, in Poland, uh, a year and a half ago, Primat Glemp in a public interview said that there was no anti-Semitism in Poland at all, but Jews were disliked for their bizarre folklore. <laughs> or as... Um, a correspondent once wrote back to me after I published her letter and, and called it anti-Semitic. She wrote back and said, you don't understand anything. It's not I who am an anti-Semitic. It's you people who are dirty race. Um, so the alibi tends to function in, in different, different ways. Uh, my paper will be different from what I understand will most of the presentations here are since it deals with the stereotypes of Roma and Jews, it does not address the issue of anti-Zionism at all. I, I want to say a few words on, on how anti-Zionism functions or does not fun function in published media, but that is not the main thrust of my paper. And there is another difference between this paper and probably many others which will um, become clear by the end. Uh, listening this morning to the horror stories from the barbaric West, um, I was immensely relieved to be living among civilized people. Um, it is not an exaggeration to say that none of the quotations that have been quoted by this morning's speakers could have appeared anywhere in the published mainstream press. None. Um, desperately trying to think of a parallel example, um, the only thing I could come up with was an article translated from the English by Robert Fisk about Lebanon, published shamefully enough in the newspaper I work for, and for which I comment Israeli and Middle Eastern affairs regularly. They said they just wanted some diversity. Um, there is an anti-Semitic, anti-Zionist, extremist fringe, at times more than a fringe, from which I could give you quotations galore. I mean, any horrible anti-Jewish, anti-Zionist expression or stereotype you could come up with has probably already been published there. But there is a very clear demarcation line between these media and the mainstream. Um, the only issues which blur this otherwise very clear demarcation line um, are a fund fundamentalist Catholic daily, Nasjennik, 
which conforms to all our expectations of what the fundamentalist Catholic daily should be. They're anti-Semitic, they're anti-Zionist, they're anti-European. Um, they're so anti that, in fact, they've become somewhat pro-Russian. Because once you move away from everything else, I mean, what else is there on the map? Which is not the obvious thing that uh, Polish Catholic fundamentalists would have um, endorsed. Uh, their influence is unclear. They claim a readership of 150,000, which might or might not be the case. They do not submit themselves um, to any kind of external audit. Uh, although they're officially independent, um, they claim the, the label of Catholic. And although they have been quite seriously censored by the Episcopate for lack of ecclesiastical discipline, um, they're also supported by an influential group of bishops. And it's a publication that certainly not only reflects the bias of its readers, but also molds it. Uh, and the other exception is the former communist daily Tribuna, with much less readership, probably around 50,000, um, which loves to give vent to its old anti-Zionist traditions, but probably um, is, is not influential in any conceivable sense. Uh, now returning to what is uh, my, my original topic, I'd like to kick it off with a quotation. When confronting my personal knowledge of them with information that prevails in social representations, especially in the media, I always experience frustration due to the discrepancy between what results from my experience and what I learn from books or press articles, end of quotation. Thus, Professor Palecny in uh, Roma um, Monthly wrote about how he reacts to the way the Rama are being described in the media. The them in the quotation referred to the Rama, the gypsies. I, I'm PC on that, okay? I, I use the term Roma, although it, it has its ambiguities to which I will, to which I will return. Uh, quite obviously, the same statement could be made about Jews. There exists a segment of the Polish media, the one that I referred to earlier, which is anti-Zionist, anti-Rama, anti-Jewish, whatever, and which presents stereotypes of both ethnic groups that, as I said, conform happily to our worst expectations. Uh, in this sense, they're uninteresting. Um, it is important to know that they are there. But there's nothing new in, in the swill of hatred. What is interesting is to look at the mainstream media and see how they reflect and analyze the situation of Rama and Jews. Um, what, I'm, what I want to do is concentrate on the coverage of Rama and Jewish issues in the two main Polish newspapers, the liberal Gazeta Wyborcza, with a print run of 450,000, and its main competitor, the conservative Rzeczpospolita, with a print run of some 200,000. Um, I'm associated with the former from, this very, from the very beginning, and I also sometimes contribute to the latter. So um, we might consider my views um, also those of a, somewhat an insider. Uh, before, however, I, um, I turn to them, I do want to spend a minute on, on the bad guys on this extremist French they mentioned. Um, it's a mixed bunch, um, essentially including um, two types of publications. There are obviously extremist right-wing publications such as Głos, Nasza Polska, Mysz Polska, Tylko Polska. Polska, of course, is Poland, and the titles say Our Poland, Polish Thought, Only Poland. Um, so they can come up with some bright new labels. Um, their print run is low. I don't believe they convince anybody. You have to actually know that they exist to buy them. They probably reflect the bias of their readers so that they shape it. The problem is that um, they're sold at newsstands, um, regular newsstands, not specialized hate literature bookstores. And um, most everybody considers them normal. My publication, I'm the publisher of the Jewish Monthly Midrash, is often put on the same bookshelf. I mean, this is about Jews, that's about Jews, so um, it's easier for the reader. Uh, they contain, as I said, all, all the obvious stereotypes about um, Jews being the enemies of Poland and Christendom, 
the perpetrators of the genocide of the Polish nation. And, I mean, you can look up all, all this stuff in whatever anti-Semitic publication. This doesn't change much. And they do attach a great deal of importance to the Jews. A um, substantial part of what they write is dedicated to us. Um, they pay much less attention to the Rama. They, of course, use the term gypsy. Um, but when they do write about gypsies, um, they um, describe how dirty they are, how thieving they are, they breed like rabbits, the garbage on Polish soil that should be thrown away, whatever. Um, then there is a second group of publications, which no longer can be safely qualified as, as marginal. And these basically include two papers, Nasz Dziennik, that I already mentioned, and um, shamefully enough, Tygodnik Solidarność, Solidarity Weekly, which is still the organ of the once legendary trade union, of which one I was one of the founders and proud militant, and which has gone to the dogs in a, in a very, very serious way. Um, Tygodnik Solidarność is uninfluential in the sense of print run. Um, they probably sell no more than 20,000 copies. Most of that, obligatory copies, which have to be bought by trade union chapters. But the logo still carries a certain cachet. And the fact that it endorses anti-Semitism, well, it's not of the worst kind and the second worst, is, is embarrassing and shameful. Um, but the enlightened public obviously approaches all those publications with reasonable mistrust. On the other hand, um, they tend to trust both Gazeta Wyborcza and Rzeczpospolita as reliable if at times partisan purveyors of information and comment. This is why I believe that um, it's important to look at how those papers present these issues, but first uh, a brief linguistic excursus. Um, in both terms, Jew and Gypsy are derogatory in colloquial Polish. In most segments of Polish society, to call somebody a Jew, to Zydzie, is an insult. Um, this, incidentally, is often used, probably not very honestly, as explanation for the anti-Semitic graffiti you see very often on, on Polish streets, which usually associate the word Jew with the name of a football team, and then recommend that those particular sportsmen be gassed, or just add the German word Raus. Um, most Poles, when asked about those graffiti, would say, oh, that's simply an expression of dislike for this football team. There's nothing anti-Semitic about it. <coughs> this does reflect the derogatory uh, connotations of, of, of the word Jew. It also reflects some other things. Um, there's a verb in Polish, Judic, which comes from Judas, or possibly directly from Jude, which means to maliciously incite. But calling somebody a gypsy in Polish is not exactly a compliment. And there's a verb, to gypsy, tsiganic, which means to cheat, deceive. Um, I, I could carry on those analogies, but um, basically we're in good company, um, Jews and Roma. There's even a Polish folk saying that says, co żyd to cygan, any Jew is a gypsy, which probably sums it up nicely. Um, there's even a folk legend that the Jews also were responsible um, for the crucifixion, either by having produced and sold the nails, or alternatively, st stolen them once it was all over. Um, I did uh, an internet word web uh, search for the year 2000 for both main dailies, and it yielded for, um, for the terms gypsy or Rama, because although both papers are rather PC-minded, and if they remember, they will use the term Rama instead of Gypsy, um, sometimes they forget, so I had to include both terms. It yielded um, for Gazeta Wyborcza 619 article entries, which meant, means that in, on that, that year, Gazeta published 619 articles containing one of those words. This might mean a huge reportage on the fate of a Roma community. Uh, it might mean that the word was there because in another text somebody met somebody who was a gypsy or a Roma, okay? But it does give a rough index of, of attention attached to, to this topic. 
which is especially interesting when we compare it with the conservative Rzecz Pospolita, which published only 13 articles con containing the word gypsy or Roma in, in the same period. Now, an analogous search for the term Jew yields 2,503 articles for Gazeta Wyborcza and 251, 10 times less, for Rzecz Pospolita. Um, and this basically is sustained if you do similar searches for the previous years and for the following years. I mean, there are fluctuations, but by and large, uh, there is a, in, in, in immeasurably more interest in things Jewish than things Rama. And consistently, Gazeta Wyborcza is much more interested in both groups than Rzeczpospolita is which is probably not, not surprising. Um, Gazeta is a liberal paper considered to be Jewish, um, both because it's liberal and because a uh, number of prominent journalists on Gazeta are, as we say in Poland, of Jewish extraction, um, although I'm the only person publicly identified with any Jewish cause. Anyway, if you go to a newsstand in Warsaw or anywhere in Poland and ask for the Jewish Gazette or the Kosher Gazette, well, this is the paper you'll get. Uh, the, this indicates both a great interest in things Jewish. I mean, 2,503 entries, even if many of them um, refer to, to, to Jews only en passant, means that practically you cannot open the paper day in, day out, without encountering something of Jewish interest. Rzecz um, Pospolita is 10 times less interested. Uh, but still, if you compare the 251 entries for Jews and the 13 entries for Roma, it shows a markedly different range of interest. Uh, now, of course, not only numbers are important. What is just as important, more important, is what is it that is being said about, about both groups? But numbers are important, especially if you consider that there are about 35,000 Roma in Poland, while the organized Jewish community has no more than 8,000 members. So the interest in things Roma and Jewish is inversely proportional to the numbers of actual numbers of, of the Roma and Jewish population in Poland. Um, this inflation of numbers is consistent throughout. If you look at right-wing publications, you'll read that there are 95,000, 100,000 Roma in Poland. And according to public opinion polls, 10% of Polish public opinion believes that there are a million or more Jews in Poland. Now, this expresses either a fear of the Roma and the Jews, which is then expressed in numerical terms, or it expresses the intent of creating such a fear by indicating how huge the Roma or, yes, I know, um, or, or, or gypsy problem is. And I haven't even started, right? Five minutes. Um, okay, down to contents analysis. Professor Palecz, whom I quoted earlier in, in, in my paper, has done the content analysis of what Rzecz Pospolita and Gazeta in the year 2000 wrote about the Roma. Um, they either wrote about Rama living in abject poverty, social isolation, squalor, um, not having access to education, not having access to running water. I mean, the Rama ghettos in Poland are, are truly an appalling sight. Um, or the articles would deal with Rama dance and music, sporadically with the extermination of the Roma by the Germans in World War II, and very often crime crime committed by Rama or attacks on Rama, which are quite frequent in Poland. Um, none of those articles were written by Rama journalists, although the two main dailies each have a, a journalist who has a good knowledge of Rama issues and good Rama contacts. But very often, apart from big leading stories, it was impossible to tell whether a journal, journalist on the paper actually investigated the story he or she was writing about or copied it from press releases or agency reports. The picture is one, therefore, of squalor, 
crime, occasionally enlivened by some song and dance. If you look at the, what the context of the articles about Jews is, you encounter a very different picture. Um, I did the analysis only for the month of December of the year 2000, but it can be roughly be assumed as representative. First of all, 60% of the articles in Gazeta Wyborcza and 50% in Rzeczpospolita dealt with issues connected with World War II. Um, now, this is the heyday of the Jedwabne debate, many of you may be familiar with, and there's an excellent paper by Jan Namichli published by the Sassoon Center and available outside, I believe, or should be available outside. So I will not enter into the issue of Jedwabne unless it emerges in the discussion. But although it, it um, might have influenced uh, the proportions increasing the, the volume of writing on World War II as compared to just one or two mentions in what regards the Roma, although the Roma were also subject to extermination. Um, this does not impact on the number of articles published. The second topic then will be in the case of Rzeczpospolita, Jewish contribution to literature, culture, science. Uh, and for Gazeta, it will be, um, it will be what? Uh, historical issues not connected with World War II. Third, both for Pospolita um, is um, contemporary Polish attitudes towards Jews. For Gazeta, issues connected with Israel, although the overwhelming majority of issues connected with Israel would not have surfaced here because you'd have to look them up under Israel or Israelis, not under Jews. There are two stark differences in the coverage of the Jews and the Rama. The first, first, the issue of crime almost never appears in connection with Jews. Okay, I grant you that we have probably less violent Jewish crime than violent Roma crime. Having said that, there's been a number of financial scandals in which some or most people involved were of Jewish origin. This was never referred to or only marginally referred to in the mainstream press, even as Ten years ago, when we had two scam artists who ripped off the state for a cool $20 million and escaped with the loot to Israel, even then, the issue of their Jewishness never came up. However, if there's a brawl in the bar and one of the people involved is a Rama, you can be sure that the headlines, including the mainstream media, will be Rama beat up people, gypsy beat up people in the bar. Therefore, ethnicity is almost always stressed when it regards the Rama almost never stressed when it regards the Jews. Um, second, positive reporting about Jews is prominent and in the case of Rama, almost non-existent. As I said, song and dance apart, there's nothing good to be read about the Rama in the mainstream Polish press. Whereas it's extremely prominent, extremely visible, the attention paid to the positive contribution of Jews to the world in general and Poland in particular. Now, this might be a conscious decision by the editors to react to the viciously anti-Semitic image of the Jew in the extremist media. And if so, it's extremely laudable. Um, it does not account for the fact that almost nothing positive is being said about the Rama. So in conclusion, it's um, probably could be safely said that yes, there is a bias connect, concerning both Jews and Rama in the mainstream Polish media. The bias is negative in respect to the Rama and positive in respect to the Jews. Once you leave the mainstream media, you move into the murky world of the extremist press, then of course the bias is negative both ways. But it's a consistent trend. You can see it also in the way Israel is being covered and I think it's a permanent element. Oh, and there has been a question left unanswered from, from the previous session, which I, as a working journalist, would like to address. Uh, there was a question, so how can a journalist um, criticize Israel, if Israel is to be criticized, without falling into the anti-Zionist campaign? Easy. Criticize the anti-Zionist campaign just as strongly. Thank you. Thank you, Constantine. Uh, 
it's of course interest to no interesting always to note that um, there can be a Jewish question or a discourse uh, over Jews in, in a country that is uh, largely devoid of Jews. And here we see the other side of the coin in terms of the projection of images and, and so forth. The popularity of Jews, however, I can only hope will uh, influence in, in a good way uh, sales of perhaps your, your monthly. So we, we shall see. Our respondent today is uh, Professor Yitzhak Brudny who, after earning his uh, PhD at Princeton University, served in uh, the Russian and Eastern European poli politics departments at Harvard, Yale, and Columbia. And since 1999, has been with, with us here at the Hebrew University. He is the author of Reinventing Russia, Russian Nationalism in the Soviet State from 1953 to 1991. Please, sorry. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, I didn't get these papers in, ahead of time, so I had to scribble notes. So forgive me about the lack of organization. And also forgive me, I'm not a specialist in the Jewish and anti-Semitism as such. So I'm a specialist in Russian, Eastern European politics in general. And as the Jewish issue comes in, I'm it's on my radar screen. And it's, uh, the truth is it's not very often on my radar screen, and partly because of the reasons mentioned by these two speakers, and I address each of these papers uh, and maybe say something about Russia, the country I know uh, the most. Uh, if something is interesting and striking, and I think in both presentations, but I'll start with Leon, uh, is so, so the anti-Semitism is off of the mainstream press. By the way, this is true about Russia as well, and the media in general, it's off. If it's, I missed the morning session, but I understand that, uh, as Kostak said, you know, uh, Eastern European media, Polish media is, is remarkably uh, free of everything which is going on in, uh, in a way. Same thing about Russia, uh, including Russian television, which I have a pleasure to watch here on a daily basis. Uh, so it is. Uh, what it is, as uh, Leon pointed out, and as uh, Kostak pointed out, uh, there is this anti-Semitic fringe, uh, which is uh, which is publishing, which is selling, which perpetuates over anti-Semitic uh, stereotypes, and which we don't know at least uh, what the degree of exposure it has, uh, and how big a real readership is of these newspapers, and even more how much the images, uh, the messages which press is sending and actually penetrating into society. Uh, uh, my own studies of Russian anti-Semitic French press, which also exist, and uh, I saw some readership uh, studies uh, done by the Russian commercial uh, posters for advertising purposes, pointed out that anti-Semitic press mm -hmm. in two major Russian cities has virtually no very elite readers, including the newspapers which are sold in Kielsk, which are sold in Moscow and St. Petersburg subways, and you think, oh boy, people read them. Well, when you see the poster checking it, less than half a percent uh, are reading them in any regular way. So it is there somewhere on the margins. Now, uh, Leon pointed out something very interesting phenomenon, uh, and it's, uh, to some degree it came out also in Costa things, that it's a role of things which are associated with religion. Uh, 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 Leon pointed out that this is rise of uh, iron godism, and this orthodox Christian of this message, which it carries. Uh, Costa spoke about this Catholic fundamentalism and to some degree the church tolerance and all kinds of things, and something which one can add in Russia, the only thing where you see anti-Semitism in the open in Russia is the Russian Orthodox Church, which is becoming more and more anti-Semitic as time goes by. Something is very interesting. I was told, I never saw it in writing anywhere, but one of the reasons uh, Russian Orthodox Church refused to sign on the protocols on a committee inquiry, on committee inquiry, identifying the remains of Tsar Nicholas II and its family, uh, saying that they were indeed killed by the, by the Red Army in a way during the Civil War, that the committee didn't explore the issue of ritual murder. 
Uh, I was thinking Russian author just got the calendar wrong because he usually reads really murder thing in Passover and the Nazar was murdered in the middle of the summer, but indeed, this is an interesting thing, if it's true, uh, if that indeed was one of the Russian author's church reasons to not to sign uh, on a committee report murdering the Nazar. So with something is similarities with the term of Eastern Europe. Uh, uh, Also interesting about the in this is comes of stereotypes and stereotypical issues. Uh, uh, Costa pointed out and Leon pointed out a lot of uh, old stereotypes, anti Semitic stereotypes, traveled to the gypsies, to the Romans. Now, in, in Russia today, there is no Romans, but somebody else who fulfills that form. There are the Chechens and other North Caucasians, but all the anti Semitic stereotypes uh, were simply transferred. Uh, to the Chechen uh, thing. Interesting enough, I remember in 1995, one of the extreme anti-Semitic parties running for elections had its electoral uh, sort of a video. And I was, and, and the guy said, who, I will tell you now who is ruling Russia. And I was expecting to hear the Jewish names uh, running this. And instead he mentioned every Muslim name he could find, a Muslim sounding name, which you find in the Russian, top of Russian bureaucracy. Well, that's a good time. Uh, so in that sense, it, all these anti the, the dirty, the clever, the breeding like a rabbit, uh, engaging in crime, everything that you can think of. Uh, in that, by the way, if no anti-Semitic stereotype can reach Russian mainstream media, some of the anti-Chechen anti stereotypes, which form a, can reach mainstream media, exactly the way they penetrate uh, mainstream media in other parts of Eastern Europe. Uh, and there is no end to that, and they only strengthened after uh, the famous incident in the uh, northwest of theater in Moscow. Now, um, the other thing uh, I would like to point out is, is something of a hypocrisy. Uh, why mainstream doesn't want to be identified anti-Semitic, uh, and even anti-Semites don't want to be identified anti-Semitic. Uh, and this is interesting enough, it's true in Eastern Europe, it isn't true in Russia uh, today, even anti uh, This was interesting, a uh, uh, couple of months ago, in a very popular kind of talk show program, run by a journalist, very prominent uh, Russian journalist, Vladimir Pozno, who's half Jew, half French, uh, and who grew up in the United States, speaks flawless English. Uh, he brought into the, into the audience, into the discussion, the representative of the new anti-Semitic party, which of course claims it's not anti-Semitic. Uh, and they used the word, the Russian derogatory word for Jew. Well, we're using the word Jid. And so, well, Pushkin used that. You know, Posner immediately brought the specialists from Russian Academy of Sciences who pointed out that in the 20th century Russia, this is a derogatory word, but they denied it anti Semitic. Or, interesting enough, of course, during this interesting open hour, this one popular program, this party has two wings, and each of them claimed that others is dominated by the Jews, of course. So, the major, as Posner pointed out, it turned out the major anti Semitic party in Russia, all dominated by the Jews, which is only can be a Jewish conspiracy. Uh, but that kind of thing, which is you cannot say, unless you're on a very, very marginal fringe, but you're an anti-Semitic. You, you can say you are, in Russia, this old tradition, you can say you're anti-Zionist. And that's how anti-Semitism comes, and if not in a mainstream press, in a kind of a marginal press, this is anti-Zionist campaigns. And, uh, and if you want to say something anti-Semitic or anti-Zionist, you start blaming America uh, and blaming uh, Israel or Jewish domination of the United States. It was very clear you saw it during the war in Yugoslavia and the bombing of Serbia where this kind of even process on the margin was actually saying which what was done was done uh, with a sort of uh, Jewish, without Jews there would be no bombing um, of Serbia. Now, um, uh, something which both of uh, people pointed out, uh, which uh, this uh, anti official anti-Semitism, or not a lack of official anti-Semitism, has to do a lot with desire to be part of Europe. Uh, uh, in a sense, uh, one can say that Russian political elite is also can be instrumentally non-anti-Semitic precisely for the same reason Russia wants to be a pol Russian political elite, want to be part of the West. Uh, and especially after Putin gave to that official uh, seal of approval, where after September 11 were part of the West, even even before the most of Russians. And what everybody in the Russian political establishment may not like Jews on a personal level, but would not say anything because he wants to be part 
example. So in that sense, Russia is not an exception, is, uh, is a part of the thing. Uh, also, it's interesting, uh, uh, this is something which is about the gypsies, which, uh, which I found is fascinating, which also tells a uh, tremendous amount of racism which still exists in Eastern Europe, and something which is, was not mentioned by both speakers, but I know it from my simple interest in soccer, of the famous incident in Bratislava when the British, uh, when the English soccer team, the, with the three black players came there, and what they say, bananas throwing on a field, and a monkey uh, imitation was done, uh, and that so it says how much anti-black anti and anti we still exist in Eastern Europe, the racism, uh, we sort of, because these were Soviet-type countries or countries with Soviet Union officially helped, so there's a backlash against it, this tremendous racism of that kind, tremendous racism in Russia, beating up of people from Africa, uh, people with a dark-looking skin, something which exists, as I understand, uh, everywhere uh, in, uh, in the in Eastern Europe, by the way, in Russia, when the Russian team lost the game in the World Cup, was a scholar, American scholar, of Indian descent. And he happened to be in the Red Square in the wrong, wrong place in the wrong time, was badly beaten up, uh, as happened to be by the, fan, the Russian fans, uh, who are fairly racist, uh, and we know that. So racism is not there in Eastern Europe or in the former Soviet Union, it simply traveled traveled uh, to the gypsies, to the Chechens, to the Africans, to whoever, and if it travels, it can travel in a circle, so it can travel back. Thank you. Thank you, Yitzhak, uh, for widening uh, the horizon of the discussion to Russia as well. Uh, I think we'll take a couple of questions, uh, if there are, or comments. Um, please. Okay, very well. Yes, please, just uh, if you could come to the microphone. Uh, a question to um, Professor Volovich. There is this trend in the post-communist uh, era in Romania to rediscover um, silenced uh, narratives from uh, the history between the two world wars. If uh, there is any critical debate of the intellectual, if there is any intellectual discourse which analyzes critically this period, and the second question, if there is any reaction to the anti-Semitic discourses in the Jewish press in Romania. Is there another question that we can take? Uh, Professor Schneelman, please, to the microphone, if you could. I have several comments, but probably I will try to make them. Well, if, there, if, there, if you would like to make a couple now, perhaps, it would be fine. And um, well, uh, I was um, fascinated with this uh, very good uh, papers. Um, and uh, I agree completely that uh, we have to distinguish between uh, mainstream uh, media and, uh, um, and, and fringe media. But what about communist media? Is it fringe or, 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 or mainstream? Well, in Russia, uh, I, I would say that it's uh, some intermediate. Uh, for example, well, um, just I will shift to, to another question, and then I, I, I will come back um, to this one. Um, according to the sociological service in the 90s, um, there is a persistent number of um, uh, violent uh, anti-Semites in, in, in Russia, approximately 5 to 7 percent. Uh, but uh, people who support uh, the Communist Party of Russia accounts for 20 percent. Uh, now, um, communist media, I mean Pravda, Pravda 5, and also I mean uh, um, Patriot. Uh, this is a newspaper of uh, People's, pa People's um, uh, Patriotic uh, Union of Russia, which, uh, which is run by the communists. 
uh, I, I found a lot of anti-Semitic uh, papers there, uh, articles. Um, uh, this propaganda is intensified uh, at the time of elections. For, for example, but uh, there is some shift in, in accents. For example, <laughs> if in 1996 uh, Zyuganov um, uh, aimed at, at Zionists, then uh, just very recently in, in, in January, he said, well, now, now he said openly that uh, uh, there is an uh, overrepresentation of the Jews in the power structure in <coughs> Russia. Um, so this is, well, this is about communists. Communists are still popular in Russia. 20% is, is a high number. Um, now, another question. Um, when the scholars discuss uh, the problem of anti-Semitism in Russia, they focus primarily on the, on the I would say, ethnic Russian or, 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 or um, anti-Semitic propaganda in, in the main cities like, like Moscow, St. Petersburg, maybe Ekaterinburg, some, something like that. And I never heard anything about um, non-Russian uh, participation in this sort of propaganda. Now, I can't agree uh, with, with um, uh, any analogy between anti-Semitic anti, anti stereotypes and anti-Chechen stereotypes. They're absolutely different. I would say more. You know that in their propaganda, uh, the Chechen guerrilla use a lot of anti-Zionist propaganda. They picked up uh, typical, what, what they call, uh, a third world or, or, or Muslim uh, uh, sort of propaganda. And I would say more. In, in, in August, I, I'm finishing, in August 1994, that is, before the first Chechen war, at the time when General uh, Dudayev was still alive, the Chechens, the Chechen leaders, among them Zilim Khan Yandarbi, uh, other guys, they signed a contract or, or, or a protocol with the most radical Russian nationalists, we, which said that uh, the Chechens are good people and the Russians are good people, but the evil which, which won this sort of, of war, uh, it's obvious, it's, uh, Zionists. Uh, so it was in August 1994. I, I, I think that uh, probably we, we have to, to make a survey of non-Russian uh, non-Russian um, um, non uh, sort of, of anti-Jewish or anti-Semitic propaganda in Russia as well. This is an open field. It's still not, not field. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Um, we will allow Leon, I, I believe, to respond to the question. And Itzhak, are you uh, no. okay? Please speak into the microphone, however. I, I will answer uh, shortly to your uh, question. Uh, there is not a real intellectual debate on the Holocaust in Romania, especially on the Romanian responsibility during the, the Holocaust. Uh, the only one hot debate was connected with an unexpected topic. The uh, Roger Garodi's book, about Les Mythes Fondateurs de la Politique Israelienne, was published by a Romanian publisher in Paris, the only one who is accepted, and it was immediately translated in Romanian. Even important intellectuals uh, defended Garodi against any accusation and the, against the trial which take place in Paris. This issue provoked a hot debate in uh, Romania. The most important debate are connected with another topic, which is the involvement of great Romanian intellectuals during the 30s in the fascist Romanian movement. This was the main intellectual debate connected with antisemitism, connected with uh, Romanian uh, fascism and the intellectual uh, involvement in uh, right-wing, extreme right wing uh, politics. Uh, 
a couple of comments. Uh, whether communist press is a uh, fringe press. Well, it's on a semi-fringe, uh, if we can say it. Uh, the way in Pravda 5, I very, I very rarely found it in anything anti-Semitic. Uh, it's more respectable version. Now, about uh, Communist Party, 20% uh, of it is anti-Semites. Well, one has not the key, you know, kind of equation what you're doing. The Communist Party is popular, it's getting 25% of the vote. The Communist Party antis uh, has anti-Semitic leadership, no doubt about that, at least part of it, Zyuganov certainly is, a famous statement in 96 in a private audience that he divides all, all Russian intellectuals to Ivan Ivanovich and Abram Abramovich uh, is known. Uh, but one has to remember people don't vote for communists because they're anti-Semitic. And they play down their anti-Semitism during election campaign. We know it from election survey. People vote for communists for any other reasons but that. By the way, the same reason is for Zirinovsky, who is anti-Semitic Jew, and, uh, but people don't vote for that. So one has to remember that the strength of this party has to do with their largely social issues. Uh, so they are party of those who lost, especially the Communist Party, not so much. And he is appealing to the sense of loss, loss of empire, loss of economic status, uh, not because they are anti-Semitic. Uh, and that one has to, has to remember uh, that uh, voting, people vote for all kinds of reasons in, in that case. No, the anti-Semitism is the least on, 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 on this thing. Now about the stereotypes. Uh, well, here I have to disagree with you. What the Chechens themselves are doing is a different business. Uh, what's how the Russians perceive them. Uh, well, dirty, scheming, uh, trying to fleece Russians, you know, in the markets. You know, is not stereotypical, stereotypical, stereotypical uh, anti-Semitic stereotypes. You know, when uh, Lysenko, Nikolai Lysenko is one of the rabid anti-Semites, government Russian television, say, I tell you, who controls Russian politics? And instead of listening to the Bronsteins and other names, which usually, which comes in this fringe anti-Semitic thing, how Jews killed Russia and had the Holocaust, same thing, the Holocaust against Russians, you hear all the Islamic sounding names. You know, is that not a, a travel of anti-Semitic stereotype? The century is much more the Russian Oh, true. But the extreme right is very marginal. Okay. I'm sure that there's much more to be said about this. However, our time in... Ah, Robert, uh, something brief? <laughs> we hope. Uh, it's a couple of comments which I think uh, one could pick out of these um, three uh, commentaries. One of them which was brought up is the question of religion. Um, and uh, to Konstantin Gebert, I, I, I would ask you, if we're talking about media and about audience, uh, Catholicism certainly is still a powerful force in Poland. Radio Maria has, I don't know, four million listeners. Uh, Anti-Semitism is pretty rampant there. The, the primate of Poland, uh, Lemp has, has now a well-deserved reputation accumulated over many years, which continued even through the Yedvabne affair. Uh, so one has to ask oneself, despite some positive signs, certainly in comparison with Western Europe, whether that, uh, that whole sediment is, is, is still not a factor that, um, that we can't uh, neglect. And, Probably this is true of other countries, including Russia, certainly Romania. Uh, the return to religion and its connection as ever in Eastern Europe with nationalism means that the potential there uh, for anti-Semitism is, is almost permanent. It's simply that the Jewish target may not be so visible, so therefore it, it, it doesn't come up all the time. The other point which I, I do think was, it was touched on, but it needs to be perhaps more highlighted. Uh, and it's very contemporary. When we talk about this great divide opening up between America and Europe, and inside Europe, between the insiders in the European Union and the new countries eager to come in to it. And we saw it over the war in Iraq. We see it over the Israel-Palestine conflict. That Eastern Europe as a whole, not Russia, but Eastern Europe, 
siding much more with the American position. So much so that the French president has literally seems to have lost his marbles recently in threatening the, the East Europeans for having dared to, to upset European unity. What kind of Europeans are you? The question is, um, what, what are the, in relation to America and Israel, what are the determining factors that, that play a role here in Eastern Europe and in Poland, uh, Romania specifically? And Russia is a different story. Okay. Uh, Constantly, would you like to respond? I was getting worried that with the first conference where I got no questions, I got so many answers. Thank you, Robert. Um, no, just very briefly. Um, I purposely limited myself to the printed press. So I didn't address the issue of electronic media and didn't uh, address the issue of church preaching, of, co of course, is also a major media factor. But just very briefly on the church. Um, the church has been the rock foundation of anti-Semitism in Europe and Poland. And I would say that probably Primate Glemp is still representative of the Polish institutional church. But there need to be two caveats need to be made. One, um, that he is facing a growing opposition within the church, which is not marginal. It's not your usual five nice Catholic intellectuals. It's bishop and archbishops. Um, the first chairman of the Episcopate's Commission for Dialogue with Judaism, who worked very hard and very decently on that commission, was promoted Archbishop of Gniezno, which is the second ecclesiastical position in the Polish Catholic Church. This sends a message to the church, which is much more important than dozens of volumes of ecumenical dialogue. It doesn't hurt to hobnob with Jews. And secondly, whereas in Romania, Russia, we may have a return to religion, um, in Poland, religion is a declining force, still immensely powerful by Western European standards. But clearly, behind its heyday, if you want to look for, for analogies, think of post-Franco Spain or think of Quebec. Uh, as those societies become democratic, the church loses its influence. And the same is also true in Poland. Um, I mean, no church-supported list ever made it more than 10% in any free Polish parliamentary election. And 10% was the lowest score the communists ever had. Not that I'm terribly happy with the high scores of the communists, but um, let's be realistic about the real impact of, of, of the church. And in regards to US and America, uh, I think that the picture is slightly more complex, um, depending on which country you want to look at. All of our countries realize that security is not an academic term, but it's something that may happen on your streets and in your homes. And as Geremek, the former Polish foreign minister, recently told the, the French ambassador who complained about Polish positions on security, as he said, are you seriously considering that we should rely on that for our security in the French army? And, and Geremek is a Francophile. Um, so this is one general factor which unites all of our countries. Security is a serious thing. Um, then, for many of our countries, America was the place where millions of our people went. Okay, There's a 10 million strong Polish diaspora in the US. But also, more to the point, um, World War II and its aftermath have been a social revolution in Eastern Europe. All the traditional social structures were destroyed. And the countries did become much more egalitarian. In the sense, the American dream from rags to riches, um, the lack of well-entrenched elites, is something that our societies react to very well, as opposed to the still very class-oriented societies of, of, of the Western part of the continent. And in what regards Israel, we have the same enemy. I mean, the Warsaw joke in 67, when the wrong side won the war, was our Jews beat their Arabs. There was a very strong sense of solidarity with Israel fighting the same fight. And also, uh, which is um, something I'm less happy with, our, the strongest supporters of Israel in Poland come from the nationalist right, because they conceive of Israel as a strong, nationalist, religious state, that doesn't hesitate to throw its weight around, nobody bothers her. 
what they would love to, to see Poland be, okay? It's not really true in respect to Israel, it will never be true in respect to Poland or so I devoutly hope, um, but it generates a strong sense of solidarity. Just to sum it up, um, had some conversations with Polish officers that served on the Golan. Um, compared to them, Netanyahu is a pinko. It's good to know. Um, yes, Johanna, please come to the microphone. I have two questions, one for Len, one for Kostek. The one to Len uh, is about the issue of the problem of antisemitism without antisemitism, an even more disturbing problem of this sort of uh, difficulty of recognition between, recognizing between what is legitimate and what is illegitimate discourse about Jews in Eastern Europe. And I will be talking here in general sense. To what extent do you think this problem, this phenomena, can be explained by the issue of internalization of anti-Jewish prejudices, stereotypes, to such a level that uh, the person who represents anti-Jewish stereotypes, which we will call anti-Semitic, uh, would not perceive himself as an anti-Semite. Uh, I mean, the one of the sort of case here would be a very clear case would be Thomas Stenbosch, the historian, the Polish historian, and actually not only him, but the way the, his, uh, the community of historians, Polish historians, reacted towards him and the position, very defensive position that have taken. Now my question to Kostek uh, is a question about the Roma communities, and also not only in Poland, but in the whole of Eastern Europe. I think what you have presented, in a sense, it, it is a reflection of, uh, of blaming the Romans for social sort of illnesses that trouble Eastern Europe at present. And to what extent do you think that this issue of blaming the Roma for crimes I mean, labeling them as the chief responsible actor for the crime, social crime, in many circles, is related to this also very clear cultural phenomenon of perceiving one's own people as innocent, and also on a social, in terms of a level of social crime. Uh, this is, of course, not only Eastern European, it's also East Southern European phenomena. In case, for example, in Greece, very often the Albanian refugees are blamed also for all social crimes. I mean, there are many, of course, cases where they commit crimes, but the labeling in here is a different matter. Okay, thank you. Uh, Costa or Leon will begin. Uh, only. Uh, uh, only a short answer for a, a great uh, a problem, because it's uh, different for our main topic. Uh, I didn't refer to this kind of antisemitism which you mentioned, which is ambiguous, which is latent, maybe yes, maybe no, some polemics which historians which expressing some antisemitic stereotypes. I refer to those antisemitic ideologists, very open, very strong anti-Semitic, refusing in the same time to be considered anti-Semitic. It's, it's ridiculous because even the main leader of the greatest anti-Semitic party in Romania refused absolutely to be considered anti-Semitic. More than that, uh, from time to time he made some gestures to demonstrate that he is not anti-Semitic. For example, he decided promote to build a monument for Itzhak Rabin in the main city in Romania because it was a great soldier, as like he wrote, a great soldier killed by the Jews. And it's true. Rabin was a great soldier killed by the Jews. Yes. So uh, the problem is this refuse to be at this, even by the greatest uh, anti-Semite. And I try to explain why it's not uh, the problem of latent intellectual more 
refinated and ambiguous anti-Semitism is a different question and it's worth to, to discuss. Johanna, I must, for the moment, um, we are just in, uh, we are in a huge backlog. Interesting question. This is a fascinating debate. I'll allow uh, Kostek to respond to your original question, and at that point, we will adjourn. Thank you. At the risk of having uh, Jonathan kill me, I, I need to make very brief follow-up to, to Leon's answer with a current Warsaw joke. Two skinheads are walking down the street, and they see a Jew. Hey, there's a Jew. Let's beat him up. The, approach him, one of the skinheads, hey, kind of biggish, this Jew. What happens if he beats us up? Us? But why? <laughs> and um, to your original question, you, you are 100% on the mark, of course. Um, the Rama are different enough, um, unknown enough, to be able to assimilate any amount of projection. Um, they serve an extremely useful social function because if crime or poverty or low educational level or whatever can be ascribed to the them and there's a clear difference between the them and the us then by definition it's no longer our problem so they of course fulfill exactly the same role as jews fulfilled in the interwar period incidentally today if 10% of what is happening to the Rama in Central Europe would be happening to the Jews, we would have a huge outcry on the international level. The tragedy of the Rama is that they do not have the intellectuals, they do not have the access to the media, they do not know how to publicize their suffering. We should help. First of all, I'd like to thank all the participants for a fascinating session. It's one of the dilemmas of a conference like this, a fruitful debate that inevitably runs over. Uh, to compensate, at least in part for that, uh, we will adjourn now and we will reconvene uh, slightly later than the program calls for. Uh, if it is at 1.30, then we will do our best to reconvene at 2 o'clock. Uh, those of you who cannot make it at 2, well, you'll uh, join us in progress. Thank you very much. See you at 2 o'clock.